I am pretty sure almost every single individual in this auditorium has probably heard of the British rock band The Beatles. Whether you are old or young, one of the biggest bands of the 60s, and what has become now one of the biggest pop culture icons of all time. And one of their most, fam one of their most popular songs really serves as the launching point for our lesson. They once sang, love is all you need, or all you need is love, love is all you need, love is all you need. And there is a lot of truth in that. Now, it is false to just say that I love. When we think about the love in the context of our lesson, it isn't just saying love or thinking that I have love or just viewing it as simply a feeling. But there is a lot of truth in what the Beatles say. All you need is love. And the love that we are talking about in the context of our lesson is is as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the greatest of all the things that abide. Of faith, hope, and, a, and love, the greatest of these is love. And so when you, when, when you look at the, the matter at hand, if I don't have love, if I don't have love, I am nothing more than sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians in verse number 1. If I don't have love, if I don't have the love under consideration here, I am literally nothing. I have nothing. And I am of no profit to anyone or anything. Now what kind of love is this? And certainly the Bible speaks. There are several words in the original languages that speak of different kinds of love. Well, it's not, brother, it's not phileo love or familial love. It's not storge love or brotherly love. It's not eros love or romantic love. It is agape love. It is the greatest love known to man. It is the greatest love that can ever be manifested. It is that which wants what is best for others. And it is certainly demonstrated by its actions. If I don't have this love, if I do not have agape love, I truly am nothing. In our lesson this morning, I want you and I to consider for the next few minutes just what makes agape love so powerful. What makes it the greatest of all these things that abide? What makes it so great? And I want to suggest to you what makes it so great is its great reach. Just how far does this love reach? Just how much impact does this love have on your life and my life? How much of an impact can it have on the lives of others if it is manifested by you and I? But above all, why should you and I manifest it? And these are all some of the questions that we are going to seek to answer in the course of the next few minutes as we consider the reach that love has. First of all, we need to think about love's downreach. We might say, well, how does love reach down? And, and this is where we deal with God's love for man. I, I, I hope you can see that. Love first reached down to you and to me. When I think about love, we first of all must consider the origination of love. Where did love come from? Did it come from man? Is it man who has determined what love is? How love is shown? And the answer to that question is no. John gives us the answer. The, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle John in 1 John 4 verse 8. When he affirms that God, Jehovah Himself, Yahweh, is love. Think, think about that for just a moment. Let that stat, don't, just let that sit in your mind. God is love. Lo love originates from God. God is the source of love. God teaches us to love through His Word. And because God is love, you and I need to be, we must be concerned with how can I love like God? How can I be loving? 
just as God is loving. And indeed, God is loving. Think about some questions as we consider this. Recognize. Recognize, first of all, the principle that it isn't you and I who first loved God. It isn't we who first loved, loved, loved God. It is that God first loved us. 1 John 4, verse 10 teaches us that herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. And thus we love God because He first loved us, according to 1 John 4, verse number 19. That staggers the imagination, does it not? That staggers my thoughts. That God loves me. We sing, we, we, we sing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, how do we know that Jesus, and Jesus is God, that He is the Son, but how do we know God loves me? And the answer is, the Bible tells me so. Think about it. The, the simple words of what we consider a child song contains a weighty implication, does it not? The Bible tells me so. Thus, people ask. I've had it asked. How has God demonstrated His love for man? How can I know that God loves me? People feel like they are so unlovable. People say, I, don't, I can't be loved. I've done a lot of horrible things in my life. I, I've, just, I've just treated people badly. I've just behaved badly. I've just... My life is a waste. I cannot be loved. Even the most unlovable is loved by God. Think about the golden text of the Bible with me. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, should not die lost but have eternal life. How much did God love the world? Now, we, we, we emphasize His love there. He loved the world, rightly so. But there's one little word that we cannot overlook as we deal with the greatness of God's love. And that is so. God so loved the world. How much did He love the world? He loved it so much that He gave His Son. Now think about that phrase, the world. You can substitute your name in there and my name in there and not do harm to the text. God so loved Robert Alexander that He gave His, own, his, only, he gave his Son. And that truly staggers my mind of God, that God loves me so much that He sent Christ. Romans 5 verse 8 is a parallel passage as well in that God commendeth or demonstrated His love toward us. Well, how do we know that? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the recognition, the realization we need to make is this. I don't deserve God's love. I don't deserve to be loved by God. Why don't I deserve God's love? Because it, because it is I who have sinned against God. I have sinned against God. 1 John 3 verse 4 teaches us that sin is transgression of God's will. Sin is a personal choice. When I choose to disregard God, when I choose to disobey God, I choose myself to sin against God. And as it were, I am personally insulting God by my actions. But not just that, I am hurting God. Do you realize that, that yes, God is angered by sin, but yet He is also grieved by sin? Sin brings sorrow to God. God hurts when He sees His creation choose to sin against Him, choose to disobey Him. What we deserve is death, Romans 6, 23. 
But yet, as I look at the cross of Calvary, as I look at why, as I consider the question, why did my Savior come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? And I see the cross. I see the love of God on full display. I think, as I think about the nails of the cross, as I think about those nails that were driven into our innocent Lord and Savior's hands, and Jesus was innocent. He was without sin. Jesus was unjustly crucified. The, the greatest injustice in the world was Jesus Christ being crucified on a Roman cross. But on the other hand, without that cross, without the events that took place on that horrible Friday, you and I would be left without hope. Because we would have no Savior. And thus we would have no way to be saved from sin. As I look at the blood-stained, innocent Lamb of God, as I picture in my mind the blood of Cal that Jesus shed on Calvary, as I picture in my mind Jesus on that cross, I see the greatest love ever demonstrated. I see the love of God. I see that love reaching down to sinful man and saying, here's the way up. You see, love reaches down. This love, this agape love, 1 Corinthians 13 love is so great because it first reached down to you and I. It reached down to provide a way to pull us out of sin. To pull us out of the realm of darkness. To reconcile us unto God. And we are reconciled unto God by the blood of the cross. Colossians 1 verse 20. But yet even in all of this we recognize and we are humbled. We are sobered by the fact that I don't deserve it. I don't deserve God's love. I don't deserve His grace. I don't deserve His mercy. But yet, God loves me. God loves me. He loves you. He loves me. He loves the whole world. And, and again, this speaks to our obligation as Christians. This emphasizes our urgency in preaching the good news of salvation, does it not? This speaks to me of why I serve God. Yes, we often emphasize we've got to fear God. And, and indeed, when we talk about the fear of God, we deal with reverence. But a lot of times we go overboard on that. We often think about you've got to be afraid of God. And yes, we fear Him who is able to destroy our bodies and souls in hell. But yet, God is lovable. Because He is love. And hence, I, I need to think about my love for God now. Because God is love, I can love God. And hence, there is the upreach of love. Love has reached down. Now love must reach up. And here comes, here comes our love. Here's our part. Our love must reach up to God. As I think about loving God with all of my heart, with all of our soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength, I ask myself the questions. Do I deliberately direct my life consciously to God as, as, as its objective? That's what it means to love Him with our heart. It means I purpose in my heart to seek and to serve God. To put Him first. Am I seeking God? Am I seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness? Further, do I consider God in all my relationships and activities? And this is where it comes down. To love, you know, love takes commitment. When you marry your spouse, when, we got, when you say, I do, you are committing yourself to your spouse, both husband and wife. As I think about Christ dying on, his, on the cross to purchase His bride with His blood, the church. He was committing Himself to the church. Saying, I am going to save you if you will serve me faithfully. If you will be my faithful bride. When we confess our faith in God, when we humble our lives and we submit our lives in obedience to God, we are making the greatest commitment known to man. We are committing ourselves 
to God. We sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And a lot of Christian and a lot of people have followed Jesus, but yet a lot of people stop following Jesus. Why? No commitment. We have to take up our cross daily and follow him. You see, you, th- you go on and sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And it goes on to say, no turning back. No turning back. It takes commitment to live the Christian life. You know, Christ never promised us a rose garden here on this earth and live in Christianity. It, he never said it was going to be easy. It wasn't easy for him. It's never been easy for the people of God to live a faithful life unto God here on this earth. And so we must be committed to Him. And that's where it begins, in the heart. I have to deliberately direct my life to God as its objective. And I need to consider God in all my relationships and activities. God must be at the forefront of all the decisions that I make. When I make my decisions daily... Do I have God? Do I have Christ in my mind? We have to ask ourselves the question. We have to ask ourselves, is my heart right with God? If my heart is not right with God, if it's not right this morning, then I need heart surgery. I need to get my heart back in rhythm with God. Either by obedience to the gospel putting off the old man of sin by repenting of our sins, confessing our faith, and being baptized into Jesus, or by rededicating my life to Christ. But if I continue my life out of rhythm with God, then there's going to be serious consequences. So is my heart right with God? But then you, you, you further consider as well you, loving Him with our soul. And it's the idea of taking inventory of the faculties that God has given us and directing them one by one to His service. We use the whole of our beating. You know, I I have a sermon that I like to preach, holy living in childlike terms. And I I base it off the the, the children's song, Oh, be careful, little hands, what what you do. Or, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. You see, that's what it takes to live a life unto God. We need holy eyesight. We need holy speech. We need to be involved with our hands in holy labor. And with our feet, we need to be involved in holy service. We, get, we use the t- t- totality of our being. We direct our lives in service to God. When we do that, we are loving Him with all of our soul. Thirdly, what about with all of our mind? It's the idea of the willingness to have our minds changed into harmony with the mind of God. And, and Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 12. You, You know, when we turn away from sin, we change the way we think. We are to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And this is so challenging. This is hard. Getting our thoughts under control is one of the hardest things we can do as Christians. But we must. We must surrender our prejudices to give up what is contrary to God's will. Self-denial is necessary. And loving God, loving Christ... Loving others. And again, it is hard. That is so challenging for you and I. Because a lot of times, it isn't others who get in our way. It is I who gets in my own way of serving God. So I have to change my mind. I have to have my mind renewed in righteousness. I have to think on those things as Paul wrote about in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7 that are pure, which are just, which are lovely, which things are of good report. And you know the rest. We need to develop the mind of Christ. As Paul wrote about Philippians 2 verse 5, the mind of humility, the mind of submission, the mind to serve. If we get our minds right with God, everything else will fall into place. We have to cultivate the Christ-like mind in our lives in order to love God with all of our mind. 
And then what about our strength? Well, that's the dedication of our energies to serving God. It's being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And we need strength for daily living. And we can be strong. Christ is our strength. We can love God with all of our strength. You, you think about Philippians 4.13, a passage I love using. And I use it... At, um, I, People would say I use it in almost every one of my sermons, but, but I love this pr passage. It is so practical and it is so, so simple, but it is so meaningful. You think about Paul there sitting in a Philippian jail cell, and yet his mindset was, I can do all things through Christ or in Christ who is my strength or which strengtheneth me. You know, too many times in life we get into the mindset of I can't. I can't go on, I just can't do it. <laughs> If anyone could have said, I can't, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Sitting there in a Roman jail cell. Sitting there in terrible conditions. But yet, his mindset was, I can. I can, sir, I can do my part. I can still live faithfully. I can still evangelize. I can still grow. You know, he, no matter who we are today as Christians, whether we are young or old, no matter our circumstances, we can love God with all of our strength because we can have the I can mindset. And, that, and again, that comes back to how we think. We have to change the way we think. We have to change our minds from saying I can't to I can. And that is why I encourage each of you to think on Philippians 4.13. Make it a daily practice to put Philippians 4.13 in your minds. And you'll be amazed at the impact it will have on your life. So that's when our love reaches upward. This is the power of agape love, is that not only has it reached down to us on the part of God, but our love reaches up to Him when we submit our lives to Him by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now here comes the challenge. Here comes the challenge. The final two points are the challenge, really challenging. There is love's in reach. And this deals with our love for one another as brethren in Christ. You look, you look at the epistles, the general epistles, and the commands given throughout to love one another. Love is the badge of discipleship. The Ephesians were told to walk in love. You know, the Romans were told, you know, love one another and thus fulfill the royal law. John, in his first general epistle, emphasizes love one another. Love in deed and in truth. You know, it is easy to talk the talk. The challenging part is walking the walk. And this is what makes Christ our perfect example. As we think about His example of love, love for one another, and he loved everyone. You think about what is said of him in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1. And I think this is a passage we need to keep in our minds as well as we think about how we emulate his example. When Luke records that he began to record all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Notice the order there. He did and then taught. He walked the walk and then talked the talk. And it takes both. We have to practice what we preach. And sometimes that can be the hardest thing for you and I to do. Because we are human. Even as Christians, we still have human tendencies. And that's why we have to let God's Word master our lives. We'll never master the book. But we can allow the book to master us. We have to recognize that love is the badge of discipleship. And it's certainly we need this lesson. A lot of times as Christians, what does the world see on the part of Christians? A lot of times we get into, you know, personal spats, tit for tat, we bite, devour. But I suggest to you, our love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ can be a powerful force for good. A powerful tool for evangelism. It presents, presents to the world that the church is a united front. You think about the song, Angry Words, as it relates to our tongues. A lot of times we sin with our tongues. 
And you think about when we get angry, a lot of times sinful words are said in our anger. Angry words will let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. We need to be careful with our tongues. How do we do that? By loving one another. When we truly, and again, loving one another, loving our families, loving our spiritual family, when we, we, we take into consideration our feelings as well. If we are angry, we be careful with what we say, but we let one another know how we are feeling so we can take care of the problem. Churches have been destroyed because brethren have allowed anger and bitterness to destroy their relationships one with another. Brethren, that ought not to be. We need to love one another. Think about a question we all should ask ourselves. How do I know I love the brethren? How do I know I love Christ? How do I know I love the church? By my conduct. By my personal conduct. That's how I know. Do I want what is best for my brothers and sisters in Christ or do I want what's best for me? Do I have the servant mentality? Do I have the servant mentality? You know, too many times Christians, I'm afraid, we view our place in the church as, as that of being served rather than to serve. You know, as a minister of the gospel, I, you know, in a sense we're all ministers, but in, my, in the role as preacher, I, I am nothing more than a servant of the church, servant of Christ, servant of righteousness. And we're all servants of righteousness as Christians. And I don't want to be served. I want to serve. I should demonstrate my love for the brethren by serving. Think about Christ demonstrating the fact that he was a servant. Remember, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve, serve, but be served, but to serve. And look at him in John 13, washing the feet of his disciples. Taught him a great object lesson on, the, on, on being a servant. Here you have their Lord, their greater, our Lord, our greater, our master, bending down to serve them. What should that teach you and I about serving? What does that teach you and I about love? It teaches us, it teaches me that love is serving. But then the fourth point, the most important point I believe of the lesson is that we have discussed love's downreach, we have looked at love's upreach, we have looked at love's inreach. Now we have to consider love's outreach. And our love reaches out by our love for our neighbors and our enemies. The question was asked prior to, by a certain lawyer there, a certain Jew in Luke 10, prior to Christ giving the parable of the Good Samaritan. He tried to justify himself. He asked, who is my neighbor? And he wanted Christ to say, your fellow Jews are your neighbors. No, that wasn't the answer that Jesus gave. He went even further than that. We're very familiar with, we're familiar with the parable of a waylaid Jew laid there on the road toward Jerusalem, between Jericho and Jerusalem. And you, and you look at all who passed him by, laid for dead. A certain priest came, passed him by. A Levite came, looked on him, passed him by. But yet, here comes a certain Samaritan. And if you're familiar with biblical history, you're familiar with the animosity the Jews had toward the Samaritans. Just as they had animosity toward the Gentiles, viewed them as less than human, so too did the Jews view the Samaritans as less than human. But yet, here comes a Samaritan, hated by the Jews, and he helps this man. So, who is my neighbor? And the answer is, all mankind. Everyone. No matter if they look differently from me. No matter their background, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their gender, no matter their nationality, no matter what language they speak. Yes, we do face a lot of cultural and language barriers, but we are all neighbors. And, and think about this even further. Let's take this a step further. God created the human race. 
Of one blood, God made the human race. You know, we're not so different after all. We may have different color skin. We may come from different nationalities. We may speak a different language. But I can tell you one thing. You cut me open. You cut, it, you cut yourself open. We all, we all have blood flowing through our veins. We all, we all bleed the same way, do we not? We all have the same problem, sin. And we all have the same need, salvation. And when we obey the gospel, we all have the same bond. We are Christians, one in Christ Jesus. We are family. But all men are our neighbors. We are to do good unto all men. Even our enemies. You know, Christ said, bless them which persecute them. Persecute you. And that is so hard for us to do. A lot of times when people do ill by us, at times as humans, we just want to say, I want to get even with them back. That's not the, that's not the way of Christianity. You know, Paul talked about in, in the book of Romans, you know, do good unto your enemy. You do good and what you're going to do is heap coal of fire under the, on their head. We might say, kill them with kindness. And remember the precept of Galatians 6.10, As you have therefore opportunity, do good unto all men. Especially those of the household of faith, but all men. So do we have the right to pick or choose who our neighbor is? And the answer is no. You see, if we truly love God... We will reach out with that love which has re we reached down to us and which we have reached upward to God and which we reach in to, our, to one another as brethren. We're going to reach out with it to others by loving our neighbors. Love is truly what we need. It's what this society needs. It's... It is, there is a reason why Paul affirmed that it is the greatest. It's because of the impact, the power, the influence that this love has. Agape love. Where would we be without it? And the answer is, we'd be hopelessly lost. We would have no hope of salvation without, without the love of God. Without God's love reaching down and without our love reaching back to God, we'd have no hope. But it also involves you and I not just reaching up to God with our love for Him, but we show our love for Him by our love for one another as brethren and for the world. This morning as we get ready to sing this invitation song, ask yourself, do I truly love God? Do I truly love one of my brethren? Do I truly love my neighbors? And if, and if my love isn't what it needs to be, Remember what was told the church at Ephesus. Remember, you need to return. You need to, you need to get your love right with God. You need, you, need to, you need to rededicate your life to God. Because love is how we're going to get to heaven. The love God showed toward us, our love toward Him, in submitting to His will, and by showing His will to others, by our love for, for one another, and for the world. This morning, if you're here, if you haven't demonstrated your love for God, you can do that now by submitting your will to His will this morning. Brethren, here will assist you. As a Christian, if your love for Christ, for, love, for God, for one another, for the world has grown cold, rekindle it this morning. Reignite the fire. Rededicate your life to God this morning while you can. And do so right now. As together we stand, as we sing.